appreciate the liberty that we had to preach today and the goodness of the Lord. It sure was a blessing. <clears throat> I'm preaching this afternoon on a subject I preached in a Bible conference recently and one that I, I really never even preached the sermon in the Bible conference. I got uh, carried away and, and never did actually even get to preaching in there. But turn with us, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and <clears throat> pray together. I'll read a, a verse of scripture too and we'll pray together. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Ask the Lord to help us. And I'll share some things with you this evening. I hope it'll be a blessing to you, be a help to you from the Bible. I'm, I'm hesitating to give you the title of the sermon. I will in just a moment. <clears throat> Brother Jordan read some of these scripture in Sunday school this morning. But First Timothy chapter 6, verse number 6. The Bible says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Man, if we could get a hold of that, that small, little, large truth in that verse of Scripture, what a blessing. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, this is talking about those who strive to be rich or desire to be rich. It doesn't mean that they are rich. And obviously they're not content, according to the verses of Scripture surrounding it. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish hurts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's not the money itself, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm, don't, don't turn there, I won't finish reading this. The Bible says in Psalm 62 and verse number 10, if riches increase, set not your heart upon them. And so the Lord is good to us. And if the Lord allows you to gain financially, you're not to set your heart upon that. Your heart is to be set upon the Lord. So verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let's pray together and I'll give you an introduction. Father, thank you for the Bible. And for the opportunity, Lord, to preach this evening. Thank you for the good services this morning, the good fellowship this afternoon. Lord, we're excited about our vacation Bible school this coming week. We do desire, Lord, that you bless in the VBS. I pray for all the workers, all the teachers, Lord, many hours. Brother Jonathan's family already put in numerous hours working on VBS. Several of these other families and ladies has already put in many hours decorating for vacation Bible school. Uh, much time has went into the lessons and lesson plans, and I pray that you would bless them abundantly for their labor. And Lord, may souls be saved this week and God's people helped and encouraged. Help our young people, Lord, to grow spiritually in the things of God, we pray. And Lord, for all that you do, we'll not fail to thank you. Would you please help us for just a few moments? We'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, sometime last month, I was asked to preach in a Bible conference in Knoxville. And one of my subjects that I was assigned was the giving church. And so I, I want to talk to you just a little bit this evening about the need for believers to be to give supernaturally and faithfully to the work of God. Now, I understand that giving is a subject that is frowned upon when it's the topic of a sermon. Oftentimes, it's frowned upon. And I can understand this for, to some extent because there are so many preachers and so many con artists who are simply after people's money, trying to fleece the people. They oftentimes prey upon the elderly and the feeble-minded. And uh, um, our pulpits oftentimes are filled with people who only want to preach about financial gain and all that kind of stuff. And then I'll be honest with you, there's our crowd. And oftentimes, I think I'm afraid that we don't preach or teach on giving enough. And I say that, I say that because of this, giving is necessary. Giving is important. In fact, the God's people giving to the ministries and to the work of God is what keeps the church going. 
If it were not for people that give, our missionaries would not be on the field and they would not be able to do the ministry that they've been called to do and the work that they've been called to do. And so giving is a means by which the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed privately and publicly. I believe the Bible teaches that we are to be faithful givers. In fact, giving should be a normal part of our lives. If you're a Christian, you've been saved for any amount of time. I think giving should be a natural and a normal part of your life. Now, we're not always, oftentimes, um, folks are not always eager to give. But I think we should be willing to teach our people to give. And uh, we need to be, learn how to be givers of our money instead of wasters of our money. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, listen, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be critical. Look, we're fixing to have VBS. I thought about this. I'm standing up here with flashing suckers and balloons and want to preach to you about giving. And, um, I, but I will tell you this. We have, the Lord has blessed us with a great number of young people. And I, I'm afraid that oftentimes we take that for granted. If you would travel around just a little bit and visit a few churches, and I'm not being critical of those churches, you have no idea how blessed you are that God has given us so many young people. And along with that is responsibility. And along with that responsibility is some, is some requirements. And it, 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 it's expensive. And that's not a complaint. That it's a blessing that we have this opportunity. And so oftentimes we are guilty of being wasters of our money instead of givers of our money. Now the Bible has a lot to say about giving. It's not just some preacher who's trying to get in your wallet. That's not the case at all whatsoever. I've had this bit of information for many years. I cannot remember where I got it from. If I did, I would be glad to mention it. And, but I, I want to say this, several things about giving. The word give in all its English forms appears 1,047 a a times in the Bible. Now that's more times than faith, hope, and love combined. Those three words combined appear 990 times in the Bible. And the word give in some form appears 1,047 times in the Bible. Given, giving is mentioned more times than... Now listen, giving is given is mentioned more times in the Bible than any other subject. Giving is mentioned two times more than heaven and hell combined. Giving is mentioned three times more than love. It's mentioned seven times more than prayer. It's mentioned eight times more than belief. Giving is mentioned in 17 of 38 parables in the Bible. Giving makes up 15% of God's Word. There are 2,350 verses in the Bible about giving. Now, I realize that all of those verses about giving are not references to giving money. I understand that. Nonetheless, giving is a subject that cannot be missed in Scripture. Now, I read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and the reason that I read that passage of Scripture to introduce the sermon is I'm aware that many people love money more than they love God. And if that's the case, they get offended when the preacher has something to say about money. However, money is not the issue. It's the love of money. And you don't have to have a lot of money to love money. In fact, you can have no money and love money. Or you can have a lot of money and love money. But money is not the issue. Money is a heart issue. And I think that is proof from the Bible as well. Abraham and David were extremely wealthy men and yet their heart and their affections were set upon the Lord. It was not set upon their financial gain. And so coveting money instead of coveting Christ is harmful to your Christian life. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, it will cause you to err from the faith. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse number 10, the Bible says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And you say, preacher, that verse doesn't say anything about giving. No, it doesn't. It simply shows that he loved the world more than he loved the things of God. And oftentimes, money and the love of money will cause you to love the things of the world more than you love the things of God. And so many have forsaken their faithfulness to the Lord because of the love of money. 
They don't have time for God. They don't have time for the church. They don't have time to get involved. They don't have time to participate in the things of the Lord or in the church ministries or, or church activities. Or, you know, and the reason for that is so they're so consumed with more. They're so consumed with a dollar and they're busy chasing another dollar. They don't have time to do anything for the Lord or anything for God. Now, the sad thing is, oftentimes, those folks don't even realize that they're hurting themselves. And not only are they hurting themselves, they're hurting others around them. This verse of Scripture that I just read, Demoth has forsaken me, having loved this present world. If you uh, remember when I was in, in 1 Timothy just a moment ago, chapter number 6, verse number 10, it said that they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Having, man, what, what a horrible thing, having pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so here's the thing. If, if, if all Christians would faithfully follow biblical instruction concerning giving, our churches would have no financial, there would be no financial needs that are not met in our churches today. And when our hearts are right with God, giving is a subject that is well received and acted upon. I want to mention several things. I'm not going to take time. I have so, so many passages of Scripture I could, I could read. I want to say this. First of all, the first point, I only got three points, and I'm, I, I understand we have choir practice. We got VBS decoration. I know all that. But, but we have preaching time. And if we ever do away with preaching time, we just as well as not have church. And so, and so we're going to preach. And now you say, I, I enjoyed it this morning was preaching to those folks. And you get say, yeah, now I'm preaching to you. And so you, you like it when I'm preaching to them, like it when I'm preaching to you too, amen. So we, we're talking about, first of all, there is the need, the need for giving. And there's several things. There's, first of all, giving to the church. Now we're talking about giving to the church, it encompasses several things. It, it, first of all, come to, come to Acts chapter 20. You know what? It, it might, I, I'm, I'm not in no hurry. I've just decided I'm not. And um, if I don't get but one point, we'll get a couple of them next week. I shouldn't have told you that. So I'm not going back next Sunday. I know what he's preaching on. So look at Acts chapter 20. Giving to the church. It encompasses several things. First of all, the weak. Look what the Bible says in Acts 20. Look at verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Look at verse 33. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that are with me. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So what we just read in this passage of scripture is Paul is working. Paul is working. He is supporting himself. He is supporting not only himself, he is supporting his travel companions and he is supporting the weak. Now, I understand that this could be the folks he's trying to help. It could be some folks that he's trying to help with some monetary needs. I'll mention that some more in a few moments. But I think he, and, and Paul is, is always trying to establish or build another church, another work. And I, I think it has to do, I think he's talking about one of the churches that he's trying to help, trying to get started. He's working, he's supporting himself. Obviously, the church can't support him. He has people who are working with him. He's trying to help support them. And he's trying to get this church off of the ground and going. So he's talking about supporting the weak. Look at, come to Romans chapter 12. He talks about, and we're talking about giving to the church. He's talking about the saints. Look at Romans chapter 12. Verse number 9. Romans chapter 12, verse number 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. 
fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now look at verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. And so the Bible here in Romans chapter 9, the Bible is teaching us uh, that one of the duties of the church is to distribute it to the necessity of the saints. There's many times that this will be a monetary situation. Someone in the church will have a physical need, a monetary need, and I believe it is our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to help those people, to distribute it to the need of the saints. Now, with that being said, and I'll mention this some more in just a moment, there's spiritual needs that are far more important that also need to be met, and that's preaching and teaching and, and a place to fellowship and to worship and to learn. All of those things, they don't give them to it. You know, the state of Virginia has never sent me a letter and said, thank you for having a church. You don't have to pay any taxes. You're, you're, we're going to, you know, American Power or Appalachian Power has never said, you know what, I'm glad you guys have a church down there in Cana. I think we'll just let you have your power for free. It, it just doesn't work that way. Amen. Now, so we have the, the week. We have the saints. Now, come to Galatians chapter 10. We talk about the household of faith. You say, preacher, that's one and the same. Amen. I'm glad you recognize that. Galatians chapter 6. Look what the Bible says. Verse number 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, I understand. Again, there's no doubt that there are monetary needs here, but don't overlook the fact that the greatest needs that men have are spiritual and as believers, we need a place to learn. We need a place to fellowship. We need a place to serve. We need a, a place to work together. And that doesn't happen without money. Everything costs money. I, I mentioned just a moment ago, we need electricity. We need heat. We need hymn books. We need tracks. We need street signs. We need church vans, Sunday schools, we, nursery. It all takes money. By the way, our church van stinks. It doesn't stink literally. I've had that thing in every shop that I know of, and I cannot get the air conditioner fixed. If you know an air conditioner guru, please give me his name. I'll call him and send him something he probably can't fix either. But um, I don't know what we're going to do with the church van. We can't, we can't get the air conditioner fixed. That's, I don't know what that had to do with other than I just read in my notes that church vans are part of a need of a church, and we, we do need a church van. So anyway, so giving to church, it has to do with a lot of things. Now, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean here. I, I'm, I'm thankful for everyone that attends, everybody that comes. It's such a blessing. But if you enjoy all the benefits that the church has to offer, you, you have a place to worship, you have a place to fellowship, you have a place you can bring your family to learn about the things of God, you, you have air conditioning and heat and fellowship and songbooks and all of that stuff, and you, you never give to support the church, you're a moocher. You ought, to, you, ought to, you ought to be willing to, to give back, to be a blessing and a help to those who are trying to provide a place for you and your family to have a place to learn and to worship. And so there's giving to the church. Then there's giving to missions and missionaries and ministries. Look at Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Listen, I, I, I want to say this. I'll, I'll say this right off the bat. Our church... I thank the Lord for our church. People give, there are so, so many people here who give sacrificially. And uh, I thank you so much for that. I really, I, I praise the Lord for it. The Lord uh, notices that. He knows that. I don't preach tithing. The reason I don't preach tithing is because if all, all you folks did was tithe, we would be in the hole every month. There's a lot of people who are giving sacrificially so we can support 40 missionaries and do all that we do and all that the church has to do. So uh, if people were just giving their 10%, there's no way all that could happen. But now if you're not giving, you ought to get started and 10% would be a good place. But um, you've been saved in the length of time. You should have gotten way beyond that by now. Philippians chapter 4. You're welcome. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 15. <clears throat> 
talking about giving to missions, missionaries, and ministries. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again into my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which, have, which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now, missions, I, I believe missions is the very heartbeat of God. I believe that souls is, is the thing that God is concerned about. And I, I think that foreign, local, domestic uh, missionaries and pastors are a must. Missionaries, families, pastors and pastors, families. We all have the, the same needs that everybody else has. We all have the same bills, the same financial needs. You know, believe it or not, we get sick just like everybody else does. And we missionaries, they, they like for their, their kids to have clothes just like you like for your kids to have clothes. And they like for their kids to have shoes just like you like for your kids to have shoes. And they, they don't have a job. They do have a job. They're trying to share the gospel with people who need to be saved. And the only way they can do that is because people are willing to give. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially these, those who labor in word and doctrine. And so there's giving to the church. There's giving to missions, missionaries, and ministries. Come to Exodus chapter 36. Whoa, preacher, we're going all the way back to Exodus. Yeah, come on back here. Exodus chapter 36. I want to look at something. Giving, giving for the building. Now, I understand that these verses that I am about to read are about Israel at the erection of the tabernacle. So we're going to use them for an example. Look what the Bible says about the giving of these people for this erection of their tabernacle. The Bible says in verse number 1, Exodus 36, Then raw Baziliel the Ahiolib, and every wise-hearted man, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding, to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. And Moses called Bazaliel and Aholab, and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary, to make it with all, and they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made, and they spake unto Moses, saying, Now look, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more Work for the offering of the sanctuary so the people were restrained from bringing. How about that? They gave so much. They gave so much that they had too much, and they had to say, look, don't, don't bring no more. We got enough. So here, here's what I want to say about that. The Bible says here that the people brought much more than enough for the service of the work. I, I've never heard a pastor say if they were in a building program or needed something uh, needed to add something to the sanctuary or, or building that they needed for the work of God, that the people gave too much. We, we just, you, you guys just outdone yourself and gave too much. Wouldn't that be a blessing? We needed something done, needed some kind of building, needed some, by the way, we do need some building work done. We need a, a sound system work really bad. And we're going to try to get that taken care of. And some other things we need as well. But the... They gave more than enough to take care of the need that, that need that had to be done. So we see the need of giving. Now, I want, to, I want you to look at something. This is what I want to really look at, and that's giving supernaturally. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Mm. Giving supernaturally and faithfully. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6.
But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, I understand this is very simple language, and it's related to harvest. If you sow only a few seeds, you can only expect a small harvest. If you sow a lot of seeds, you can expect a large harvest. We, we, I know all about that from gardening. And if, if you don't believe that, just buy a whole, a whole flat of uh, cucumber things and plant all of them. And pretty soon you'll be stopping cars when they come by on the road trying to give away cucumbers because... Uh, believe me, you, uh, we did that one year. I think I brought a five-gallon bucket and set it on the porch every Wednesday night for I don't know how many months because uh, we had cucumbers running out our ears. So if, if you sow a few seeds, you, you reap a small reward. You sow a lot, you reap a lot. And that has to do with, with, with everything in your spiritual life. Listen, God has proven himself to be faithful to this truth like he's proven himself to be faithful to every other truth in the Bible. And it's not, it may not be in, now listen, here, here's the thing. It may not be in this life that you reap the way you think you should reap because of the way you're sowing. But I promise you that our God is just and our God is faithful and our God is righteous and our God is holy. And if he has made you this promise, if you will sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. I promise you there is a day coming here or there you're going to reap bountifully for sowing bountifully. Amen. Listen, this is true in our giving. This is true in our witnessing. We, all, we want to see people saved. We want, to come, we want people to come to the knowledge of the Lord. Well, if that's really true, we're going to be witnessing. We're going to be sowing the seed in people's life, trying to get people saved. So it's true in giving. It's true in, in witnessing. It's true in our ministry outreach. If we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we reap bountifully. Now let's look at some verses. Hold your praise in 2 Corinthians. We're going to come back as time allows. Come to Proverbs chapter 11. I know this message is not exciting and people are, are not re rejoicing. But it's biblical instruction. Proverbs chapter 11. Look at verse 24. Proverbs 11, 24 there is that scattereth. Now, it's talking about giving to several different things. We mentioned earlier, we talked about giving to the church. We talked about giving to ministries. We talked about giving to special needs or certain needs of the church. So his scattereth. He's, he's given to support several things. So there is that scattereth and yet increase of, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat or more than is necessary. But it tendeth. That word tendeth means it moves in a certain direction. And so if you're a hoarder, not a scatter, it tendeth to poverty. Potter, to poverty. There we go. It tendeth to poverty. Uh, verse 25 says the liberal soul. Now this is not the liberal, the modern political movement that you and I are familiar with. This is talking about giving bountifully. One who gives bountifully. The liberal soul, not body shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Now, what we have in the Bible, we have a Bible principle here in the book of Proverbs that says he that scattereth, so he's giving, but he is increasing. And he, the one that is withholding, is the one that is moving towards poverty. So the one who gives bountifully is the one who is going to be watered. Look at Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19, you're in Proverbs 12. We'll look at several things in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 17. Proverbs 19, verse 17 says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. Now listen, our motive for giving is not that we will get something in return. However, I will tell you this, the, the Scripture repeatedly there are many scriptures that support the idea that there is a special care for those who give with the right attitude and the right motive. The Lord, the Lord is a He is a rewarder of them who give cheerfully. And, and man, this you can't out I've heard the say it many times, and I ain't just heard it. I have proved it. You cannot outgive God. There's I, I promise you that. Look at look at Proverbs 22, verse number nine. There's, I'll just say this. 
There is no way that I can, I mean, I can tell you what the Bible says, but there's no way that I can prove to you how faithful God is unless you're willing to trust Him by faith and give to Him faithfully, sacrificially, and regularly. I promise you He is a faithful God. And you, you cannot outgive Him. Look at Proverbs 22, verse number 9. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Now that word bountiful means free to give. It means liberal in bestowing gifts and favors. It's talking about being generous. He hath a bountiful eye. You say, preacher, all of that is Proverbs. They're just principles. Okay, well, good. Come to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. By the way, all the Word of God is given for our instruction. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 15. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. The Bible says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. Now look at verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, and odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Several things about these verses, verses 15 through 18. First of all, from this passage, realize that giving is a sacrifice. If we're going to purpose in our hearts to give bountifully, we must realize that we're, that's going to require sacrifice of something on our part. Second of all, notice that giving sacrificially is acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Third thing we notice in this passage of Scripture is that it's not necessarily about the amount. Some are able to give a lot. Some are not able to give much. Some are able to give a lot, but, they never, but it's never a sacrifice. It's never sacrificial giving. And some can only give a little, and it's all sacrificial giving. So we have, you and I, we have been privileged to live in the most wealthy, probably the most wealthy country in the world. And, and even... Even if you look around and see yourself far below some others that you may know, you have no idea how wealthy you are. I, I think it would do everybody good to take at least one foreign mission trip to a third world country. Upon arriving home, you'll be a completely changed individual. It'll revolutionize your life to realize what you have. You consider yourself to be poor. No, we, we, are, we are extremely blessed. Extremely blessed. And listen, if you're, if you're not able or will not, and I'm not going to say not able because everyone is able to give something. Preacher, you don't, no, you don't understand. Everybody is able to give something. So the, the thing is, is just are you willing to do that? So look at, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, I, I know that, you know, this sermon gets long because people, hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I, I'm trying to, go, I just want to show you from the Bible. And listen, I, I say the same thing as Paul said in Philippians. I, I'm not telling you this because I desire a gift. Obviously, it costs money for the church to, and, and, and I want to say this too. You guys are, far better to me than, than I deserve. There, there was a time that my wife and I both were working and I was working overtime. I even worked two jobs for a large part of the first part of our marriage. And we were just reminiscing, thanking the Lord the other day. We are, you know, my wife helps out with the grandbabies and homeschooling and taking care of her parents. And, and I pastor the church. I, I, you guys are so good to me. We are far better off now than we've ever been in our entire lives. And I've, I've tried my best with the help of the Lord. And I, and I don't say, that, I say this because it's true. 
we have a, a desire as a couple, a goal as a couple, to increase our giving every year. Every year we want to give more. Many years, many years, the Lord allowed us to do that without receiving more. Our, our, our intake did not increase, but we kept trying to continue to increase what went out. And, and now the Lord has, in the last few years, the Lord has really increased what we take in. I didn't do it for that. I'm just trying to tell you that God is faithful. And if you will trust Him, it is amazing how He will bless you abundantly. I, I'm, that's, that's just the truth. David said, I think the verse was mentioned this morning in Sunday school. David said, I've, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or received begging bread. Now, obviously, I, I, we are, I, I hope you didn't take that wrong. We are by no means wealthy. One, one heart attack, one stroke, one car accident. We're, we're broke tomorrow. I understand that. But listen, I'm not trusting an insurance company to get me through that. I'm trusting the same God that turned my lights on and put shoes on my feet this morning to take care of me tomorrow, regardless of what tomorrow holds. And next week, and listen, I'm not saying be stupid. You ought to, you ought to plan. You ought to talk to Brother Michael. He can help you plan for all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm not talking about I'm just saying this. My confidence and my faith is in God alone. Amen. Amen. He, he, is, he is wonderful. Now look at this. And I know, I, I, I'm rumbling, rambling. Look, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. <clears throat> Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, that means to know, K-N-O-W, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, you, you are well aware of the fact that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is dealing with the subject of giving. When our hearts are right with God, giving will be a subject that is well received. Almost every reference to grace in these two chapters is referred to giving of money. And we oftentimes refer to it as the grace of giving. The churches of Macedonia, he made mention of in verse number one, the church of Macedonia, that includes the churches of Thessalonica, the churches of Philippi, and probably even the church of Berea. Now look at verse number two. It says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now we can see... We can see from their example that trials, affliction, and poverty are no excuse for not giving. These churches of Macedonia, they had great affliction, they had trials, they had, uh, they had deep poverty, but they, there was no excuse for them not giving. So my question is, what is your excuse for not giving? There are many believers, they're not afflicted, they're not in poverty, but they still will not give. In fact, the Bible says here in this passage, now listen, I'm not preaching to any of you. This is for the people listening on the internet, okay? So, in, in, fact, in fact, the Bible says, the Bible says, says this, here, that they were in a great trial of affliction and they were in deep poverty. Now, I'm not certain what all those circumstances are exactly. I can't tell you exactly what all those different things were, but I, but I do know this. I know that if you're in great affliction, you're not well. And if I know that you're in deep poverty, you don't have a lot financially. I'm smart enough to understand that. And yet they were willing to give. How, notice the abundance of their joy. It says how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. So there was a great trial of affliction, but there was an abundance of joy. There was deep poverty, and yet there was riches of their liberality. And so, listen, that tightwad that's squeezing every dime that he ever comes across and he's not willing to give anything to the work of God, he's not happy. The one who is in affliction and poverty and is willing to give for the furtherance of the gospel and the things of God, he's the one that's happy. Amen. Now, let me, let's, let me get one more. Can I just get a couple more verses? Look at verse number three. For to their power, I by re bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So the churches gave more than they were able to give. They gave beyond what was their power to give. We're talking about giving supernaturally. Paul said, I bear record. In other words, Paul said, I will testify the fact that they didn't have it to give. And so how did they give it? They trusted God 
and were able to give by the grace of God. The Bible says here that they were willing. Now, you know what that means? That means that they did not have to. They were not forced to. Uh, no one asked them to. Amen. They gave and they did it willingly of themselves. You know, the Bible, the Bible teaches us that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And these churches here that Paul's talking about in Macedonia is one of the great examples of walking by faith and not by sight. Look at verse number four. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. These people were in such affliction and such poverty that they had to beg the Apostle Paul to take their offering because they were so needy and so poor. And yet, so many people, so many people who are able will not simply because they don't want to. It's a heart thing. It's a heart thing. Verse number four again, pray us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. You know what they wanted to do? I, I'm, I'm going to quit. I got tons more. They wanted, they wanted a part in being a blessing to the saints. And don't you want a part in being a blessing to the saints? I, I'm talking about, it's a blessing. We couldn't have this place to fellowship and worship if you guys didn't get and give. There'd be no way to do it. We couldn't have missionaries if you guys wasn't willing to give. We couldn't do that. We couldn't have all these activities. We couldn't have balloons up here for the kids to enjoy if you guys weren't willing to give. We couldn't have Bible conferences and missions conferences and revivals and activities for the children. People give. People give sacrificially. Thank you so much for that. Listen, there's. I, I'm not going to... Woman of Zarephath, she gave sacrificially. Mary of Bethany, she gave sacrificially. The poor widow woman, she gave sacrificially. The early church, they gave sacrificially. I think you and I ought to be willing to give faithfully and sacrificially to the work of God. Father, thank you for the Bible. There's so much to preach and so little time. I pray you'd help us, Lord, to always have a desire to be pleasing to you in our lives. Be faithful, Lord, in our daily walk. Help us. Lord, to not just be a Christian in word, but to be a Christian in action. And help us, Lord, to live lives that bring honor to the name of the Lord. Help us to, to give of our financial means to support the work of God. Lord, we sure need your help in, in all these areas, we pray. We sure love you. We sure thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.